All right, we're going to talk about something called mutual inductance. So let's say I've got this lovely coil right here and this one here as well. This one actually has got an EMF source here, a battery of some sort. So we'll find out it needs to be an adjustable voltage applied to it in some way, shape, or form. So, but they're going to be wrapped around some common core here. So we often use something that's uh, like ferromagnetic or something like that. That way we get as much magnetic flux as possible and therefore as much changing magnetic flux as possible. But what we'll find out is that if I have an EMF here in this coil, it's going to induce this one to have an EMF as well and vice versa, it turns out. And we call this mutual inductance. Uh, let's take a look at this for a second. So let's say I have a switch and I close the switch on this circuit and it reaches its maximum current and just is continuous. Just nice constant current flow through here. So which way would the magnetic field created by this lovely set of coils point? Yeah, if we wrap our fingers around in the direction of, so the coils in the current direction, so we'd end up with a, actually a magnetic field pointing to the left. Cool with that? Cool. Would that magnetic field be changing? If I'd reached my peak current, and not at all. So it would actually just be a constant magnetic field pointing to the left. And so this wire over here would be, would be experiencing that constant magnetic field pointing left. Because it's constant, though, is there any change in flux? No. So should there be any induced EMF or current in this coil? No. So however, if instead, one, I could look at a situation where I just, just flicked the switch. Does the current go instantaneously to its max? No, it takes a little bit of time to grow. And as that current grows, so does the magnetic field pointing left that it would result in. And so in that point, I would actually, during that brief period where it reaches its peak value, I would actually induce an EMF and a current in this guy. The other thing is if I just have an adjustable voltage source and I slowly turn, crank up that voltage, as long as it's increasing, so I would have a change in flux there as well. So and that's actually what question number six deals with. Let's take a look at that before we look at the math here. So question six says, if the current in the coil on the left here is increasing, then which direction does the current pass through this resistor here on the right? So if it's increasing, so again, we said if we curl our fingers around in the direction of the coil, we create a magnetic field pointing left. And if that current is increasing, then the magnetic field pointing left is going to be increasing as well. So which way would the change in flux point? Also to the left. And so in this coil, we need to create a current that would oppose that. So I need to go around this way to create a magnetic flux pointing to the right. And so if I do that, then as I go around pointing to the right, go to this last coil, and I've got to pass through that resistor pointing to the right as well. So it just so happens to be how this guy's wrapped around this coil. If I wrap it around in opposite fashion, it would have been the other way around. So that's just Lenz's law, and this is mutual inductance. If we look at kind of the math behind this, it's on your hand out there. All right, so the math here. So you might recognize the first part here. What is this first part? Negative n times the change in the flux over the change in time. What is that? That's Faraday's law. So it just says the EMF just is related to the change in the flux over the change in time. And if you've got multiple turns of coil, great. Those factor in as well. So that's just Faraday's law. Well, here we can actually relate it to the change in current over the change in time via this proportionality constant we call the mutual inductance. And the SI unit for the inductance is the Henry. What could you say a Henry is equal to if you realize that this combination is equal to volts? So changing current would be amps, changing time would be seconds. So if I bring this over, I'd have volts times seconds over amps. And that's what a Henry is. Cool. And so this is just mutual inductance. And so we see that in this case, the current, I'm sorry, the change in flux resulting from coil number one is going to cause an EMF in the other, and vice versa, it turns out. They have an equal and opposite effect on each other, especially if this change in flux over change in time. The reason we might use a ferromagnetic material like this is that the change in flux over the change in one of two caused on one is going to be equal to the one on two if it's all captured in this ferromagnetic 
uh, material that they're both wrapped around. And so we'll see a direct application of this in just a second in Transformers. All right, you guys ready to talk about Transformers? So real quick rewind, we dealt with mutual inductions back here. So if you recall, when this lovely EMF, so if I close some switch on this circuit and it reached its peak current, and as long as that current remained constant, was there a change in flux? No. And so was there an induced EMF in this other coil? No. So in this case, we said that either when you immediately close a switch or open a switch, and there's a time where the current's either building up or coming down, or if you had an adjustable voltage, that's where you get an adjustable changing flux. So, okay. So the only time we'd actually induce an EMF in this other coil is if the current in this one is changing, either because I closed the switch, or it's been running for a while on open switch, or I have some sort of variable voltage source here that I can ramp up or ramp down. And as long as it's changing, I would induce an EMF in this guy. With the transformer, we're gonna see a similar situation, except transformers are kind of part of your normal AC power supply. So alternating current, so we've got some sort of alternating current source, that's what this symbol right here means. And because the current is alternating, it's changing the whole time. I don't have to have some sort of like adjustable source or worry about right when I close the switch or only right when I open the switch. With an AC source of voltage here, uh, I've got a continuously changing current and therefore a continuously changing magnetic field and therefore a continuously changing magnetic flux. And so we are always going to be inducing an EMF in the secondary coil. So with a transformer, we talk about a primary coil and a secondary coil, sometimes called primary winding and secondary winding. So what we'll find out is that the EMF in this first one is related to the number of turns times the change in flux of the change of time, Faraday's law. And in the second one, the number of turns times the change in flux of the change in time. And the idea is that we wrap these guys around a common ferromagnetic core. Technically, I mean, we could put them near each other in air, but it's hard to capture all the magnetic flux that way. But if we capture all the magnetic flux in this common core, then any change in flux in one would equal the change in the other. If you notice, if you rearrange this a little bit, what would the change in flux over the change in time equal if you rearranged and solve for it? Yeah, it equal negative. EMF over number of turns, N. And it'd be the same thing here. And as a result, you can therefore say that E1 over N1 equals E2 over N2. That's where that lovely equation comes from. So in here, EMF is the same thing as potential difference delta V. So sometimes you'll see it as epsilon here, sometimes you'll see it delta V, same diff, same diff. So if you notice, if these are equal, that means the more turns you have, what has to be true about your delta V, your EMF? The bigger it has to be as well. And so in this case, we just vary the number of turns that are wrapped around this ferromagnetic material to vary what kind of voltage you have on each side. So in these transformers can be step up or step down transformers. So if you look, what's the normal uh, potential difference coming out of a typical outlet in your wall? So yeah, 120, 110, somewhere in there. So if you look, is that what it is in the power lines? Is it higher or smaller? Higher, way higher. And so what happens is we have a much larger potential difference going through your power lines. And so when it gets to your house, or at least gets to some part of your neighborhood, it needs to come down quite a bit. And we use a transformer to accomplish that. And in that case, we'd use what's called a step down transformer. We're going from high voltage to low voltage. If I wanted to go from low to high, I'd use a step up transformer. We just regulate it by how many turns here. So in this case, like a step down transformer, you'd have a lot of turns in the primary coil relative to much fewer turns in the secondary coil. And and more turns on the primary means it's at a higher voltage. Less turns in the secondary means it's at a lower voltage. So that's kind of how your transformer works. So and it's all governed by this equation right here. If you also notice, though, the power in the primary and the power in the secondary is exactly the same, though. And if you recall, what is the power? So what's the power through a resistor is where we originally learned it, but same diff here. Yeah, delta VI or delta V squared over R, if you want to look at resistor, or I squared R. But So we don't have to necessarily look at the power in a resistor. We can look at kind of a number of circuit elements in this fashion, including the primary and secondary coils in a transformer. And so in this case, we could also say that delta V1 I1 equals delta V2 I2. And so if you look, in our example, did we say the primary or the secondary had a greater potential difference? primary. And if the primary has a greater potential difference, what's going to be true about its current? 
it's going to be lower. So if you notice, with a much greater potential difference, so going through the power lines and stuff like that, they must have a much smaller current actually passing through them. So as compared to your house and stuff like that. So in this case, the greater the turns, the greater the potential difference, but the smaller the current. And everything's exactly proportional to the, how different the number of turns are. So if you look at question number seven, question number seven says a primary coil has got 500 turns and a secondary coil has 50 turns. So the primary coil has an EMF of 1200 volts and a current of one amp. <clears throat> and the question is, if the secondary coil only has 50 turns, then what is its EMF and what is its current? So if you notice, what factor fewer turns do we have here? 10. So 10 times fewer turns, what does that mean about the voltage? 10 times lower. And what's 10 times lower than 1200? 120 volts. Let me get that better. So, but what does that mean for the current? 10 times higher. What's 10 times higher than one amp? 10 amps. So what would be the power in our primary circuit here? 1200 what? Yes. Didn't even give me a chance to do my joke. So and what would be the power in the secondary coil? 1200 watts as well. Sweet. So they tried to counteract one. It's not that they counteract one, but you can't, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You're not gonna get more power than you had in the primary coil or something like that. So the power here is the power that gets transmitted to the secondary coil.